It's been an incredible year. Uh, the SpaceX team, I think, is uh, the best space team that has ever been assembled on the face of the Earth by far. Uh, and the achievements of the past year demonstrate that. Uh, I think to a degree that is mind-blowing. Like what you have achieved over the past year is nothing short of incredible. And one day we will indeed occupy Mars. <laughs> so so let's, so let's go through everything that, uh, that SpaceX has, has achieved that you have done. Um, and uh, it's, a it's actually going to take a while, by the way. <laughs> this, this is going to take a minute. Um, so first of all, with Falcon, we have uh, achieved the most launches of any rocket in a single year ever. So the, the next best is, uh, the, was the Soviet Soyuz which I think did a little over 60 launches in a year, and we did uh, 96. So, uh, this, this, yeah, so no other uh, family of orbital class rockets has launched more than 63 times a year, that was Soyuz, um, and we did 50% more. Uh, the Falcon Heavy also surpassed, in terms of heavy lift vehicles, the record for Saturn V, uh, which I think did yeah, I think we, 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 with five launches last year, we exceeded the Saturn V record. So that was like pretty incredible on Falcon Heavy. So <laughs> this gives you a sense in pictures of how incredible that was. Um, you know, for a while there, I was like, when I was like, I'd be posting something. Is this like the launch that just happened, or the one that is happening, or <laughs> like because there were like three launches that happened in the space of a few days. So, uh, but this is all the launches on one page. And um, yes, yeah, it's really, really incredible. Uh, all made it to orbit, all landed. Uh, so uh, just a huge hand for the Falcon team. That was incredible. So. And um, uh, two thirds of the missions were Starlink, but a third were for other uh, customers, uh, for uh, NASA, for uh, other communication satellites, um, so uh, it was a combination of, our, of Starlink plus a lot, lot of other uh, missions. Um, so, so even if you just take the non-Starlink portion of the flights, that was more than any other vehicle last year by a long shot. Uh, we launched NASA's uh, Psyche, uh, ESA's Euclid, the uh, X-37B space plane, um, multiple transporter missions. Uh, we launched did missions for OneWeb, Biosat, um, and we're actually on contract to launch Amazon's uh, Kuiper <laughs> constellation. Um, and we treat everyone fairly, so, you know. Um, just one, uh, so, and, just, and, and, and we, we managed to do uh, 19 flights on a single Falcon 9 booster, which is really incredible, um, in three and a half years. Uh, so, and, and that, that uh, vehicle did, that booster did 860 satellites and uh, delivered 260 metric tons to orbit. So it's like, wow. So there's a lot of wows. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, it's worth, uh, you know, like how, like how long ago was it that we landed a, a booster? It was actually eight years ago uh, in, in December, uh, roughly, roughly eight years ago. And since that time, we've landed 260 times. So 260 landings. It's just like, wow. Um, I mean, there were a lot of people that said, that it couldn't be done, and then there were a lot of people that said, even if it could be done, it's gonna, it's a dumb idea. Um, that no, that it wouldn't, it wouldn't pay off. That it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't make sense. But we've shown that, in fact, it is absolutely the right idea. Uh, reusability is the key to uh, a great future in space. It's essential. We need reusability with rockets, just like we have reusability for cars, for airplanes, for bicycles, for horses. Obviously. Reusability is, is essential, um, and the, the fundamental invention that is necessary for humanity to become a, a multi-planet species is a full and rapidly, basically rapidly reusable, reliable rocket. Uh, so, like space pirate.
Animal propulsion is now moving. So it's, I mean, it's incredible how much has happened in eight years. So, you know, I wonder what, what, what will things be like eight years from now? Um, and hopefully we have, I think we will have landed on Mars. Um, and I think we will have sent people to the moon. And, uh, and maybe if we get lucky, we will have sent people to Mars uh, within eight years. Um, you know, the... You know, the, the, the key question sort of, I think, about for civilization is our, uh, uh, the, the key test, perhaps, for civilization is do we make it through the spermy great filter of being a, going from a one-planet civilization to a multi-planet civilization? Um, and if we, are, if we do become a multi-planet civilization, we may go out there to other star systems and discover many long-dead one-planet civilizations. And we don't want to be one of them. That's lame. We don't want to be one of those lame one-planet civilizations. Um, but I think we should always re regard civilization as fragile, as not something that, n not a situation where there is an inevitable upward trajectory. Um, I mean, I read a lot about history, and if you look at, if you read read history, you you see that civilizations are anything but permanent. That many civilizations have risen and fallen over the years, over the centuries and millennia. And uh, eventually the sun will expand, boil the oceans, and destroy all life on Earth. Um, now, admittedly, that's, you know, several hundred million years in the future. But um, it's only about maybe 10 or 20 percent of the existence of Earth itself. If Earth is four and a half billion years old, then another 10, 10, 20 percent um, longer and life would, or intelligent life would not have evolved because it's taken us a long time to get to this point. So, you know, that's that's really my, that's that's really the key test. Do we become a self-sustaining, multi-planet civilization uh, while while civilization still exists, or 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 don't we? But that you know, I think that's that's a, really the key question. Um, I think we've got a good chance, but it's not a sure thing. Um, 
that's why time is of the, uh, time is of the essence. I think we want to make Mars self-sustaining as quickly as possible. It's not just a question of getting people to Mars, but it's getting enough tonnage and equipment to Mars to make enable Mars to be self-sustaining. The, the, the key test being that if the resupply ships from Earth stop coming for any reason, do we, does Mars die out or does it continue? That's, the, that's the, really the fundamental threshold to pass the, the Fermi paradox great filter. And the Fermi paradox is where are the aliens? You know, if, 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 if life is common, if intelligent life is common, shouldn't we see a lot of evidence of it? Now, I get asked a lot about, um, you know, aliens, actually. And I usually say I am one. Well, actually, I used to be, according to, you know, Homeland Security. Um, it's an alien registration card, literally. I was like, okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, but, but the truth is I actually have not seen any evidence of aliens, which I think is maybe a bit more troubling than if I had. Um, I, I have not seen any, and I'd be on it, and I you can pretty much guarantee that I would post about it instantly, okay? <laughs> I was like, yep, this is, we, we got one. <laughs> this is a spaceship for sure. Um, but I have not seen anything. So that leads me to think that we're more likely to be um, a tiny candle of consciousness in a vast uh, emptiness, a vast darkness. Um, you know, that the civilization that we have is really just this very, very small candle in a vast darkness. And we just must do everything possible to ensure that that candle does not go out. Yeah. Anyway, I think we can do it. So, you know. <laughs> but we need to move fast. Because you just never know. I mean, there could be, you know. At any given point, there's a... Like Stephen Hawking, actually, I believe, said that he thought there was, like, roughly a 1% chance in any given century of civilization ending. That was his rough estimate. I think it actually might be higher than that. So we just want to go there fast. So th this is the, getting back to Falcon 9, back to reality. Um, this is, uh, these are all the launches we've done. And you can see how the cadence of launches has rapidly increased over time. I think pe people online have actually <laughs> assembled videos showing every, every launch. Um, and it just gets like crazy fast as you get to 2023. Um, so, yeah, so we've, and we've, we've done a 19.3 flight. We're now uh, qualifying Falcon 9 to be able to do 40 flights. Um, and we're aiming for uh, maybe as much as 150 flights this year. So, and then uh, let's not forget fairing, fairing recovery, because actually a lot of people don't realize we re recover the fairing as well. This was actually very difficult to recover the fairing. So it costs an immense amount of effort. Um, but we now quite regularly recover the fairing, and we've uh, reflown fairings 300 times. So congrats to the, the fairing recovery team. That was actually pretty damn hard. So. Oh, and then, of course, uh, we do operate basically a small navy. Uh, I think people don't, don't always know that. Uh, but we have, uh, you know, drone ships and... Uh, support ships of various kinds. So we've got a small uh, fleet of ships. Um, and uh, we operate them very efficiently. Um, I think people also sometimes don't know the size. Like, you can see the size of the ship by the, the person walking around on it. It's not small. So it looks cool. I like this sort of it's kind of a Darth, Darth Vader aesthetic, but it's, I like it. So, and, and we're also getting much better with the pad turnaround. Uh, we achieved a three-day pad turnaround, and I think we're aiming to hopefully, I think, get under 24 hours uh, pad turnaround by the end of this year. So in terms of, uh, yeah, launch rate, uh, yeah, so it's been 15 years since uh, Flight 1 of Falcon 1. I'm oh, sorry, Flight 4 of Falcon 1, the first one to reach orbit. Um, so... 15 years since we've, we've got anything at all to, to orbit. Um, yeah. 
And now we're aiming to have 150 flights or thereabouts this year. So, and these are big rockets at this point. Falcon 1 is a little rocket. In fact, when I see Falcon 1 right now, I was like, man, I think I'd probably tuck that under my arm and just take it home with me. <laughs> you know, it was like, launch it in the backyard or something. Uh, it looks so cute. Um, but it, at the time, Falcon 1 did seem like extremely, it, it was extremely difficult. It took us four flights to reach orbit. And um, it did seem kind of big at the time, but now, now it's like an adorable thing. Um, so, yeah. So the, I, the most, I think the most profound metric, or the, the metric that really uh, describes the magnitude of what SpaceX uh, achieved in 2023 is the mass to orbit number. So, and you can see that it, it, the incredible change just year over year. Uh, so 2021, we're slightly below rest of world. Uh, 22, we, I think, roughly doubled what the rest of the world did. And um, last year, we were 80% of all mass to orbit. So uh, when rest of the world, we mean like the rest of U.S. industry, you know, Europe, India, China, Japan, everyone. So uh, there's, there's not a lot of industries where a company is doing like 80% of everything. And, and then the, the, what's really mind-boggling is uh, <laughs> that, that, that number should increase by 50% this year. So I guess on the order of like 90% of all mass to orbit, not, ca not counting Starship. So if we start, as we start launching Starship, Starship is like you know, roughly 100 tons to orbit with every flight. There's a path to getting Starship to do uh, over 200 tons with full reusability. Um, so 200 tons to useful orbit with full reusability. And um, yeah, it's really an incredible amount. 1,200 tons of useful load to orbit last year. Um, yeah, that's, that's just astounding. So I, I think that, that really deserves a round of applause. Like, like wow, I mean, it's just, that's the most mind-blowing. And the rate of increase is just uh, astonishing. Um, now, these numbers will actually look very small in the future. In order to um, build a city on Mars, we'll, we'll need to be kind of in the... Uh, million ton to orbit range. So maybe a little higher, ideally a little higher, but it's, it's sort of, if you, you just try to get things to the right order of magnitude, like not trying to get to the exact number, but try to get the order of magnitude right. Um, I think it's, it's on the order, it's roughly a million tons uh, to, to Earth orbit. Uh, that'll, that'll get you roughly 200,000 tons to the surface of Mars. So roughly, you know, approximately 20% of whatever you get to Earth orbit, you can get to the surface of Mars. Um, so, uh, and figure like maybe we need at least a million tons of useful load to the surface of Mars for, this, for it to become self-sustaining. That self-sustaining threshold is, is actually a very tough threshold to meet because even if you're missing a tiny thing, then uh, eventually that Mars will die out. So you've got to be able to not just build, for example, computer chips, but you need to be able to build computer chip uh, factories. Because if you can't build computer chip factories, the factory that you do build will eventually break down, and then you will have no chips, and then you're t that, that's it. So uh, it's kind of like a long sea voyage, where if you're just missing vitamin C, yeah, you'll cruise on for a while, but then, uh, you know, your teeth will fall out and you'll die. So... Um, that was a real problem in the old days. Um, so, um, anyway, it's, it's quite a, a high threshold. It, and, and like Mars is, a, it's, Mars is a fixer upper of a planet. Um, you know, it needs some work. But, so it's not like you can just like run around outdoors and like, you know, fish or live off the land. You know, you can live, can't live off the land on Mars. Um, so it's, it's really quite a lot of work that's required uh, to make that work. Um, so Dragon, uh, an amazing amount of progress with Dragon and an incredible track record of success. Um, so by, uh, as of last year, uh, the Dragon's fleet, uh, uh, time on orbit exceeded the space shuttle fleet. 
So we had a cumulative uh, 1300, over 1,300 days of time on orbit last, uh, as, as of last year. So it's, that's pretty mind-boggling that Dragon has now had more days in orbit than the entire space shuttle fleet. It's like, wow. So, um, yeah. And we've, we've had, uh, now Dragon has visited the space station more times than the space shuttle as well. This is an incredible, incredible achievement by the Dragon team. So once again, you know, like, yeah, as I was saying, this really has been an incredible, 2023 was like maybe the best year in the company's history. I mean, it was the best year in the company's history, actually. So there's a lot of great things to go through. Um, so, and I'm, I'm not one who gives out false praise. So it, it's really mind boggling what, uh, what you've achieved. Um, so all of the missions last year uh, used a, uh, a flight-proven uh, Dragon. Uh, so uh, the, these were all these are all these Dragons had all flown before, and um, and this year we're looking to fly maybe seven or eight uh, Dragon missions. So it's really been yeah a fantastic success by the Dragon team. This doesn't have audio. <laughs> There's no sound in space. <laughs> yeah, it's a great that's a great looking spacesuit. And in dragon interior. So, yeah, so we've, we've, we've now sent 42 humans to orbit, to be precise. Space is, space is relatively easy, but orbit is very difficult. Um, so we've, we've now taken 42 humans to orbit and back. Um, and I have to say, like, yeah, if there's one thing I, I, I wish for, it is that we bring them all back safely. That's like sometimes, sometimes people like say, well, what is the one thing you wish for? I said, I wish we bring this astronauts back safely. That's one thing. If I had one wish, that's what it would be. So uh, we also have now completed a second uh, crew arm in, in Florida. So we've got uh, two towers that are capable of, two launch pads that are capable of sending um, astronauts to, to orbit. Um, and uh, this is going to be great for being able to shift missions between uh, Pad 40 and Pad 39A. Uh, we've got uh, this year our first spacewalk, um, and uh, so we've got to redesign the the suit so that uh, you can actually move around in it, and you don't just like you know pop out like. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you just inflate the suit, you know you just basically, you know you're kind of like one of those like. Uh, Balloons at a party or something, you know. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's quite hard to make the to still be mobile in an inflated suit, um, and um, ha have the joints move and stuff. And and then we we will actually uh, evacuate the whole spacecraft. So uh, everyone, even those that don't go on the spacewalk, will still be in vacuum. So obviously very important that it work. Um, you know, we don't have like a little hole in the suit or something go zipping around. <laughs> um, so, but I, I think, you know, obviously we're going to put a lot of testing into this. And, uh, but this, this is going to be another significant milestone, which is to have a suit where you can be in like the, the vacuum of space with just nothing, nothing at all, and just be out there. It's hard to, con it's actually hard to conceive the concept of nothingness. And it's not technically nothing, like there's a small number of particles per, per cubic meter, but uh, it's pretty damn close to nothing. Um, you know, if you, if, if you lose too much, uh, too much air, too, too much oxygen, uh, that's it. There's no place to get oxygen from. So like an airplane, even at high altitude, can uh, increase its, the, the, uh, the pressurization pumps and get more more atmosphere from, because it's in the atmosphere. Dragon springs a, an oxygen leak, and that oxygen leak is too significant. There is no place to get oxygen. You're just going to die. So the requirements for getting everything perfect are uh, 
insane. It's, everything's got to be absolutely perfect to work. Um, I mean, we did not, you know, evolve to live in space, obviously. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. Um, but this is, this is really going to be another great milestone, is to actually be, have, be able to have someone floating out there, you know, in the vacuum of space, and come back. Um, and we do want to actually have, we want to have a spacesuit that you can walk around in, because if you're on the moon, you're on the, you want to be able to walk around the moon, walk around on Mars. So having a high mobility spacesuit that actually uh, isn't crazy expensive, ideally, uh, and that you can walk around in comfortably is, is a big deal. It's actually an important thing that needs to be developed. Um, and ultimately made in large numbers. Because if we send, say, a million people to Mars, then uh, that's a million spacesuits, or a million Mars suits that you need. So we'll have to make a lot of these things. And we're also going to launch, launch Starlink on that flight. So then coming to Starlink, uh, this, is, uh, this is normally a whole separate company. Uh, but uh, we, we're basically uh, building, rebuilding the internet in space, which is pretty wild. Um, and uh, now it, it is, I, I want to emphasize, supplemental to the terrestrial internet. Sometimes people think, well, is Starlink just going to take over and destroy all the terrestrial internet? I, I, it definitely will not. Uh, but what it will do is Starlink will give access to the internet to, to people that either don't have access uh, or where their access is extremely expensive or, or very, very bad access. So this is a massive enabler for uh, improving and enabling, you know, uh, people in remote locations to learn anything. Like you can basically learn almost anything for free on the internet right now. Like for example, MIT has all of its lessons on YouTube. You can, you can learn almost anything if you've got an internet connection. But if you don't have an internet connection, you're limited to, I guess, book, you know, what, maybe you've got some books or something, but not, it's, it's a, basically Starlink is a game changer for improving people's quality of life around the world. Like it's, this might be the single well, certainly one of the, I think, it might be the number one, my, uh, over time, uh, technology that improves people's standard of living around the world. It's certainly a candidate for potentially being the most profound uh, thing that actually improves uh, quality of life for people around the world, which would be really something to be proud of, obviously. Um, so, let's see, and we're, we're now introducing the, the V2 minis. Uh, so this is next generation uh, satellites that we've um, introduced into the constellation, and uh, yeah, these are twice twice the capacity of uh, last year, so from 88 uh, terabits per second to 165. Um, and uh, our goal, the, the the biggest single goal for Starlink from a technical standpoint, is to get uh, the um, mean latency below 20 milliseconds. So that would uh, that actually makes it for immediacy of, for, for actually the quality of internet experience, this is actually a really big deal. Uh, also, if you play video games like I sometimes do, uh, this is also important. Um, otherwise, you lose. So, um, so this is, uh, anyway, so th but that's actually a very, very hard problem. But because we're a low Earth orbit constellation, the speed of light it, uh, it, is, is what, what do you think the speed of light is? Um, 300 kilometers per millisecond. So if we're at 550 kilometers, think of it like roughly two milliseconds up, two milliseconds down. So if you go up, down, up, down, so eight milliseconds, speed of light limitation. And then uh, almost everything else we can actually address. It, like we can't go faster than the speed of light um, yet, you know, but uh, yeah, probably ever. Huh. Um, but we can we can we can get the rest of the the time I think below uh, below 10 milliseconds, and so then it, it basically it'll be it'll be uh, more responsive than ground internet in most cases, which is really what we're after here. Um, so uh, yeah, this is really amazing work. We also have now launched the argon hole thrusters, uh, which are very low cost. Uh, and use argon, which is uh, plentiful. So we've gone from uh, using krypton, um, which is not that rare. I mean, if Superman did come here, I'd be like, you can get some krypton, you know, and squirt gun or something like that. And okay, now what? 
Um, so uh, krypton is a noble gas that is, it, it's moderately rare. Um, but we would actually be using a huge percentage of the world's krypton if we were launching that with uh, the Gen 2 satellites. And so we moved to argon. And ar argon is, is actually extremely plentiful. In fact, right now you are breathing approximately 1% argon. So argon is, there's a lot of, of argon. <laughs> um, and, uh, but this is really the, I, th I think the first uh, significant uh, argon uh, hole thruster and certainly by far the most cost efficient and uh, the most power efficient. Um, and it was a really great job by the Starlink team to create th this thruster. Um, and, and many other upgrades to the, then there's the in-space laser stuff. I mean, so this is by far, I, th I think we've now sent at least um, a thousand times more data, maybe 10,000 times more data uh, over laser links in space than any other system before. Um, I think we'll, we'll soon be like a million times more data transferred, maybe more than that, uh, through this, 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 the Starlink uh, uh, laser interconnects between the satellites. Um, so we now have 9,000 9, active space lasers. So uh, sort of vaguely reminds me of Dr. Evil, you know. Uh, <laughs> lasers from space. Actually, well, I guess I made that joke a long time ago. It's like Dra Dragon does have LIDAR. It has like a laser... Uh, for um, you know, uh, docking with the space station, so it's like it's like dragons with lasers. I mean, like that would be better than shocks with lasers. Um, uh, and each link, uh, each laser link is capable of 100 uh, gigabits per second, and we're looking to increase that. Uh, so let's see. This is an animation of uh, all the places where Starlink is active. So obviously, a lot of the Starlink activations depend on country approvals. So as we uh, are able to get a country approval, then you see rapid adoption within a country. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll get uh, most countries, most of the rest of the countries will get the approval hopefully this year. Um, and we'll be able to go almost uh, worldwide. Some countries are probably unlikely to approve our system. Uh, but. Um, uh, most most countries we th we think we should be able to uh, get to, so. Um, and our goal this year is to activate service in um, more than half of the world's population, so that would be uh, that would be fantastic. Um, but I do want to emphasize because uh, we are going to put this uh, this presentation on online that Starlink is supplemental to terrestrial uh, internet. Um, it is not uh, does not replace it. It is. Um, Starlink does, not, it does really well for uh, like low population density areas, um, but it is, it is really not going to be competitive in high density cities. Uh, or it's, it's really low, low, low density situations, which is really where the need is. Um, so anyway, it works well, with, works well with other internet providers is what I'm saying. Um, then we've got community gateways. Uh, I'm told this is a town called Unalaska in Alaska. So that's a, that's a real place. Um, so we're, we're, we're putting um, a lot more gateways down. Uh, as we increase the number of gateways, that improves latency. So we've now shipped our next gen hardware. Uh, that's a version four of the user terminal. So that uh, allows us to lower the cost of Starlink. And uh, we'll be introducing the Starlink Mini later this year, which can fit in a backpack. So that'll be pretty cool for anyone who wants a very portable Starlink. And then we just uh, opened our Starlink factory um, in Bastrop, Texas. So that's just a, a little, you know, about 20 minutes away from Austin. And this is uh, this is going to be, <laughs> yeah. I guess I guess some of you guys are part of that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, in general, we're going we're to have like a massive round of applause for Starlink. That is for sure, because uh, it's like the achievement level there is is amazing. Actually, let's, let's just have a massive round of applause. It's like, goddamn. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, it's hard to clap with this thing. <laughs> um, yeah, this, the Starlink achievements are really mind blowing. Um, 
So it's uh, like the, the Starlink system is an anomaly in the matrix. Um, and then we also just recently launched our, our first direct-to-cell satellites, and um, <laughs> we um, were able to, to send text messages directly from a phone to the satellite and then back down again. So uh, we did intentionally uh, misspell these things, by the way. Um, so, um, although actually when I first saw it, I was like, is this real? Um, <laughs> but it turns out it is in fact real. Um, this is, um, yeah, some Dogecoin jokes, basically. Um, so yeah, and anyway, so it's, it's, it's kind of amazing that you can actually close the link between uh, a phone in your hand and a satellite that's hundreds of miles away. Um, and the, the satellite can hear the tiny signal that your phone is outputting, which is like such a faint whisper, it's ridiculous. Um, but it can actually somehow hear that faint whisper and be able to communicate with a phone is, is I think, it's one of those things like, I was sure, is that actually physically possible? But it, it is. Um, now, um, now, I do want to emphasize this is also a, not a competitor to, uh, to phone companies. Um, this is something that will be supplemental, so uh, it's, it's going to be very helpful for remote areas where there's no cell connectivity, or once in a while within a city, if there is a place that has no connectivity within a city, uh, then Starlink will be able to uh, communicate with, with phones. Um, but it's... Uh, I think it's some, something on the order of seven megabits per second within a, within a cell, and the cells are uh, sort of hundreds of uh, square miles or kilometers in size. So it's really it's good for um, you know text messages. You, you could technically do video if you're the only one or if there's only a few people in that cell, like if you're in the middle of the Pacific or something like that. Then. Um, but it, but it is something that is going to be very helpful and will, I think, save lives of people. You know, if somebody's sort of hiking in a remote region and um, they get lost, well, now their phone could actually work, and it could, I think it will actually save a lot of lives, which is cool. So. And then we, we have uh, se seven um, announced partnerships. So we've got T-Mobile in the U.S., uh, Rogers in Canada, Optus in Australia, uh, One New Zealand, Salt in, in Switzerland, KDDI in Japan, and Intel in Chile and Peru. So, and we expect to announce a number of other uh, telco partnerships this year. So uh, this is definitely something where we're, again, in partnership with telcos. I just basically don't want telcos to get really mad at us. Uh, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Um, you know, we want to we support the telcos. And then, of course... Uh, yeah. This is slowed down a little, so. <laughs> but that first launch did, did take, a, take a while to get off the pad. <laughs> Throw it right there for a second. I mean, when that took off, I was like, wow, I can't believe it took off. <laughs> that was my reaction. So I think it's incredible that it, we, we took off twice last year. Um, I mean, even though I've been very you know, closely you know, involved with the Starship program from the beginning, um, 
And actually, like I lived out here. This is my, my primary residence for three years. Um, this used to be a sandbar, basically, what we're looking at here. Um, and now it's got a, an advanced rocket factory and, and a gigantic launch pad, and we've got a whole bunch of rockets out there. Um, but I'm still amazed that it actually got put together and it took off. I'm like, wow. Um, I mean, the a Starship is uh, more than twice the thrust of a Saturn V. It is by far the biggest flying object ever made. Um, and for, you know, with, with some upgrades down the road, it'll, it'll actually be, I think, probably over 20 million pounds of thrust. Um, and Saturn V is seven and a half. So it, it'll, it'll end up being three times the thrust of Saturn V. Um, and it's going to fly a lot. It has to fly a lot. So it's, it's going to end up flying several times a day um, from many different locations in the world. And I think there's a pretty good chance that it, it does Earth-to-Earth -earth transport as well. Because the fastest way to get from one place to another on Earth is, you know, to get from here to the other side of Earth is an intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, but just make sure you delete the nuke and add the landing part, <laughs> basically. Um, that's the fastest way to get somewhere. Yeah, wow. And then uh, between flight one and two, we made a number of, of massive upgrades. So the, there was obviously a massive upgrade to the launch pad. Um, so we've got like our many Niagara Falls here. Um, I mean, the, the water pressure is so much that if it went straight up, it would actually destroy the rocket. That's how much water pressure it is. So it's like, wow. Um, and it worked. Like, oh, actually, it went and looked at one of the first things I went and looked at after uh, the um, second launch was to check out the launch pad, because obviously after the first launch, we dug a pretty big hole. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and honestly, it looked like you could just, it looked like there was no damage at all. Like the, the, you could just launch again, basically, for the pad itself. Um, so it's great work by the team to radically improve the launch pad overnight. Yeah. <laughs> the people always like want to use the Statue of Liberty for stuff. Um, Statue of Liberty is not that big. I was like, yeah, I was like, been there. I actually climbed up the Statue of Liberty in the tiny staircase a long time ago. Um, but it, anyway, this, this is a big rocket. Um, and it will get uh, bigger over time. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So that's, I don't know if you guys watched uh, Kong versus Godzilla. Uh, it's like one of the most insane movies I've ever seen, but it's like kind of entertaining in its sheer madness. Um, and um, the crazy thing is that, that our launch tower is bigger than Mechazilla. And it's going to do basically like the same thing, but with the arms, you know, like catch the rocket. And when I tell people, like, yeah, we're going to catch the largest flying object ever with giant mechanical arms. They're like, there's no way that's real. I mean, we could give it legs, too. <laughs> just, just give it legs and have it tromp around. That'd be pretty cool. Um, so... <laughs> and then we're also going to build a second tower. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna, this is this is we're going to really be launching a lot, and up, and we're going to be upgrading one tower while we launch from another tower. So two towers is important. Um, and there, was, there, there are actually so many upgrades between flight one and two that uh, it would actually take it like hours to go through them all. Uh, but one of the biggest upgrades was uh, going from uh, hydraulic to electric uh, actuation of the engines. So that actually uh, saved a lot of mass and complexity. Uh, so, yeah, um, the electric TVC, I mean, it, it, it was just, a, this is one of the biggest upgrades. We also massively upgraded the heat shield. The engines themselves were massively upgraded. Literally everything on the rocket was, uh, like, there might have been thousands of upgrades between flight one and two. Um, so really gigantic improvement between flight one and two, and 
also obviously many improvements between flight two and three. And then we've got, we've got a whole uh, development plan to, like I said, ultimately get to a fully reusable rocket that does over 200 tons to orbit on a regular basis, full reusability. Yeah, hot staging. I mean, hot staging was, was a change that was basically, I don't know, just really within a space of like th three or four months, maybe less, um, going from, or roughly that, uh, going from uh, previously just kind of like a separating the rocket without anything <laughs> uh, and to, to actually lighting the upper stage engines uh, while the first stage engines are still thrusting um, and not blowing up the ship, which is, that was an amazing achievement. So I was like, wow, that's, and it worked. Um, so I was like, wow. So, um, so then let, let's look at uh, flight two. Attention all operators on countdown one. This is the final go, no go for flight two of Starship. Gainer two zero is at 7 a.m. Central. Raptor one. Go. Raptor two. Go. Stage one. Go. Stage two. Go. Copy, go for flight. Clock is rolling. So, yeah, big round of applause, guys. Wow. So fly, Flight 2 actually almost made it to orbit. Um, so, uh, in fact, ironically, if, um, if it had had a payload, it would have made it to orbit uh, because the reason that it actually didn't quite make it to orbit was we vented the liquid oxygen, and the liquid oxygen uh, ultimately led to fire and an, ex and an explosion, because we, we wanted to vent the liquid oxygen, because we normally wouldn't have that liquid oxygen if we had a payload. <laughs> so ironically, if it had a payload, it would have reached orbit. Um, and so I think we've got a really good shot of reaching orbit with flight three, and then uh, a rapid cadence to achieve full and rapid reusability. And I mean, the, kind of the mind-blowing thing is, like, there is an actual path that we are on to make life multiplanetary. Can you friggin' believe that? Like, what? I... Yeah, we just gotta get it done before civilization ends, but, but like, I think we, a thing is gonna happen. Um, yeah, right here. So, anyway, so in terms of, Getting there, we obviously want to accelerate the production and testing, um, get to a high cadence. Uh, you know, for, for any given technology development, there it is. Um, you know, how many iterations do you have, and what is the amount of time between each iteration? So every time we launch, we learn. Every time we launch or do a test, we we learn something more. So increasing that cadence of launching and testing, um, and it's always better to sacrifice 
uh, hardware rather than sacrifice time. Like time is the, true, the one true currency. Um, so it's, it, the fa it's sort of the fastest path to, uh, you know, as I was saying earlier, rapidly, re re rapidly reusable reliable rocket. Um, yeah. So, um, and we've got, uh, yeah, a block, uh, sort of a version two ship uh, that will be more reliable, better performance endurance. We've got a, a version three ship uh, design that will stretch that, that be even taller, <laughs> probably end up being, I don't know, 140 meters before it's all said and done, maybe 150 in the end, in, in, in length. Um, so, uh, yeah. So it'll be even taller <laughs> than it currently is. Um, yeah, and so with with flight with, with flight one, the goal was not to blow the, the the pad up and ideally get get some distance, which we did. With flight two, it was to get past a staging, so we achieved the goal of getting past uh, staging, and almost to orbit. And then flight uh, flight three, we've got uh, well, we want to get to orbit, and we want to do uh, an, an in space uh, engine burn uh, from the header tank and and prove uh, the that we can re reliably deorbit. Um, we want to do a tipping point uh, header domain uh, propellant transfer. Uh, this is uh, important for the uh, NASA Artemis program. And uh, we want to uh, also demonstrate the, the payload door for the sort of PES dispenser for um, delivering the Starlink, the, the, the V2 non-mini, actually probably V, I guess V3 technically, uh, but really the really giant satellites to uh, orbit. Um, yeah. So, like I said, the, the, the mass orbit ultimately of Starship will be, you know, over time, I think millions of tons of, of payload to orbit. Um, so, it's, it, I mean, compared to present day mass to orbit, it'll be more than, more than a thousand times, I mean, you know, more, more than a thousand times greater than, uh, mass to orbit currently. That's what it will be eventually, or it needs to be. Um, so we also want to demonstrate uh, on-orbit refilling. This is uh, very important for the NASA Artemis program. Um, so we're very proud to be part of the NASA Artemis program. I'm always in incredibly grateful to NASA for their support um, and for trusting us uh, to do um, to take, take astronauts to orbit, to trans take cargo to the space station, and to be an integral part of, of getting astronauts back to the moon. Um, one of the other questions I get a lot is, did we really go to the moon? Um, I've gotten that from, from a lot of people, and I'm like, yes, we went to the moon. Uh, more than once, in fact. Uh, but the crazy thing is that it's been over half a century since we last went to the moon. So. Uh, you know, that's the, I think what, maybe that's what causes people to be skeptical. Like, how come we, we can't go to the moon now? Um, it was r 66 years from the first controlled powered flight of the Wright brothers in 1903 uh, to landing on the moon in 69. So only 66 years. But, you know, over, like 50 years have passed since we last went to the moon. Um, but now we're going to get, go back there, and we're going to go back there soon. Um, and we're not going to go just. I think, we, like we want to, the next step. I think is to build a, a, a moon base, like Moon Base Alpha, make sci-fi real. <laughs> not to, add, remove the fire part of sci-fi. <laughs> so, um, but now, one, but in order to go and land on the moon, one of the technical challenges we have to solve is uh, orbital refilling, where we dock, the starships dock on orbit and transfer propellant. Um, now, we've gotten very good at docking, because we've, we dock with uh, Dragon to the space station, which is actually more complicated than docking with our own spacecraft. So we have a lot of expertise in docking, so I'm, I'm confident we will solve this, and we just ideally want to solve it, hopefully by the end of this year, uh, but certainly by, uh, by next year. Um, and that, that's a big deal. This is one of the fundamental technologies that's necessary um, 
to, to build a city on Mars and to have a, Mars, a moon base. Um, and then, yeah, we'll also be launching some very big satellites. Um, world's biggest pest dispenser. <laughs> and we do hope to do this uh, by the end of this year. Um, and then, yeah, more about the NASA uh, human landing system. So, um, as I said, we're extremely grateful to NASA for entrusting us with a fundamental part of the Artemis program. Uh, we want to make sure we do a great job for NASA. Um, and, uh, and really, the, we, like, we are a very fundamental part of the, uh, the Artemis program. So if we, if we do not succeed, which we will, um, but, but we, we, in order for the Artemis program to succeed, we must succeed with, uh, with, with Starship. Um, and um, like I said, we actually want to far, far, ex, far exceed what NASA has asked us to do. So, so the, we, we want to go far beyond the NASA requirements and, and actually be able to put enough payload on the moon um, with enough frequency that you could actually have a permanently occupied moon base. That's, that's the next really big threshold from Apollo, uh, is have, a, have an actual moon base. Um, I remember seeing this, like, I guess kind of cheesy sci-fi show a long time ago called Moonbase Alpha. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen that, but, um, like, the moon actually drifts away from Earth. Now, this is not going to happen, but, um, but it was a cool show, Moonbase Alpha. Um, but we need a real moon, moon base alpha, and we're going to do it. So uh, then, uh, yeah, as I was saying, the, this is the long-term goal. This is what we want Mars to look like, is uh, starships coming and going, um, an incredible, beautiful Mars city, and uh, a flourishing uh, civilization on Mars. Um, and... Um, you know, ultimately, we can transform Mars into an Earth-like planet with uh, terraforming. Um, just needs to be warmed up, really, and then you could it, it could be ultimately an Earth-like planet, and we could bring the life from Earth. We could, we could extend life from Earth to Mars, um, and really, it's, it has to be you know it has to be humans, I yeah, because uh, it's not gonna be the dolphins, um, so. But we can, bring, we can bring all the creatures with us, and we can ensure that life on Earth continues on Mars uh, even after Earth becomes unlivable in the, in the distant future. So anyway, I'll go into questions.